Good. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm really happy today to introduce Professor Caster Ruban for this seminar of the Negrom uh, series. And uh, I mean, for me, it's a pleasure to have him uh, at the series. And today he will talk about our ARBM for Schrodinger equation. So the floor is yours, Professor Ruban. Thank you. So thank you very, very much for this uh, kind introduction, also for the possibility to speak here. It's a great environment that you started with these online seminars. And you see here now, if a, we would have better weather the view out of my office towards uh, the highest church tower in the world in Ulm and also the Alps uh, behind it. Uh, as uh, Maria was saying, I'm going to talk on the Schrödinger equation. Um, and uh, with respect to the reduced basis method, so I will also explain, let's leave my point of view to the RBM in a nutshell, speak uh, about well posedness, uh, variational formulations, and in particular, an ultra weak form, give you some numerical experiments and a summary and outlook. Um, this talk is based upon joint work with my uh, PhD student, Stefan Hein, and uh, you can uh, see also most of what I'm going to talk about in this uh, archive um, preprint. Um, when when uh, I was asked to give a title for this talk, I choose a reduced basis method for Schrödinger, but then I realized that maybe a better title will be preparations for a reduced basis method for Schrödinger. And you will see why this is maybe uh, ultimately would have been a better title. Good, so here's uh, what I wouldn't to consider in today's talk. And of course, I mean, if you have questions in between, please feel free just to interrupt me and uh, just unmute yourself and, and ask questions. Um, I consider a finite time interval. Sometimes also T might tend to infinity, but typically the final time T here is finite. We look at a bounded domain in space, which is an R3n. N is the number of particles, so that this might be uh, comparably large. Um, so some people do consider often the full space, namely omega equal to Rn, but here we consider uh, a bounded one, but taking a limit as long as you uh, assume some certain decay properties of the involved function is the same as well. The boundary is assumed to be smooth. That is uh, somehow important. Um, and I also consider certain uh, ingredients that we might see in the uh, RB setting as parameters. The one is the right-hand side. Um, omega t that will be used in the SQL quite often is the time uh, tensor with the or cross product with the, uh, the space. Um, and as you already see here, the right-hand side takes values in C and the same also is true for the, uh, for the solution that we're looking at. The initial state might also be uh, a parameter and finally also the potential which acts on space and time. So as you see here, uh, all the three might be parameter functions that is in general not completely trivial in the RB framework, but there are some, some papers in that direction, or you may assume that those ingredients are parameterized so that um, uh, you go into the standard framework of RB. And then here is the parameterized Schrodinger equation, linear Schrodinger equation in atomic units. Um, so you see the Laplace in, uh, in space here. Here's the potential with a minus sign. Uh, time derivative with the complex unit in before. Okay, so that's why I would like to, to, to show you my point of view on the reduced basis method because it explains why we are considering certain questions to be discussed uh, later on. So we have this operator equation, so the parameterized PDE in that form. 
And since this is an operator equation, it's posed in a function space. And here I would like to denote the function space by y prime. The uh, y prime is the dual of y, and we will later see why this y plays a role. And that is then transferred towards a um, variational formulation with a bilinear form B. It depends on the parameter. We look for the solution depending on this uh, parameter or parameters, and we have test functions v here and y. So y is, is always going to be the test space, whereas we look for the solution in another space x, so in a petrov galerkin framework, you have x and y. And as we typically assume in the RB context, uh, we have a detailed discretization at our hand. Um, often the reduced basis framework here with the curly n denoted, I would want to use delta here because delta could be a space n time uh, discretization index. So think of a couple of dt, delta t, and, and h. However, the dimension of this detailed discretization is the curly n, and we think that this is, uh, think of uh, as being very large, so that you cannot afford to uh, use that in an, in an online uh, or multi-query context. So what, but what we assume that the exact solution of the operator equation or of the PPDE is undistinguishable from the truth one. So whatever parameter you might insert here, this is always below a prescribed tolerance epsilon. That's why we also call this the truth. And finally, we, uh, we assume that this is computable in a linear complexity. Good, then the reduced spaces here, I would want to denote them by X index N. So this straight N is uh, small. And since we have different trial and test spaces, we also need a second set of uh, reduced uh, test uh, functions. And as you see here, this might depend on the parameter for stability reasons. This N is small, much smaller than the curly N. And typically this reduced system is determined in an offline phase by greedy kind of learning algorithms. Then our goal is always to come up with an error estimate where you take the difference between the exact state and the reduced approximation, sometimes with the delta, sometimes without the delta. The important thing is that we always have a good upper bound in the sense that this error is strictly less or equal this delta n and this delta n uh, needs to be computable in a fast manner. And then the offline training works as follows. You pick a finite training set out of this set of all parameters. You select samples of the parameter by maximizing this uh, uh, error estimator over the training set. You start your uh, detailed uh, truth discretization by putting here the parameters that you choose. You uh, take your favorite finite element, finite volume, spectral element, DG solver, and you get this Xi i in the offline phase. And then finally, this space Xn is then just the linear space that is the span over all those snapshots. Now we are left with constructing the, uh, the reduced uh, test space, and you may, may uh, uh, construct that by supermises introduced by Gianluigi, Andrea, and others. We will come back to that also a little later. Okay, then in the online phase, uh, you are given a new value for the parameter, and then we want to compute a reduced approximation with a complexity typically n cubed. But the important thing is here you might also see something different than not cubed. But the important thing is that this is independent on the of the truth this uh, truth dimension. So that's what we call online efficient. And in addition to that. Uh, reduced approximation, we are always able to give an upper bound for the error so that this delta n here is uh, rapidly computed, computable so that we can not only give a reduced approximation, but also an upper bound for the error. Good. Now you may ask, why the hell does that work? Many of you know that, but uh, I was told to be not too quick at the beginning. So um, uh, the reason why this might work is that we do have some analysis concerning the Kolmogorov n width, which is basically the best approximation you can do with n degrees of freedom. So what is this? 
we ask for the infimum, so for the best possible approximation, as long as xn is a subset of the trial space x of dimension n. So these are the given n degrees of freedom and might be small. Then we ask for the error in the worst case. So we ask for the worst case error with respect to the parameter. You can also think of uh, um, um, L2 error bounds here, but here we look at the supremum and then you ask for the best approximation in the reduced space between the exact solution and the reduced one. So that is a, the, the famous Kolmogorov n width. And it is important to note that the decay of that Kolmogorov n width, namely how fast does this animal go here to zero as n increases is a property of the problem only. It has nothing to do so far with any kind of discretization. And the question, if, this Kolmogorov n with decays fast or decays slowly decides whether a given problem can be well approximated by a, by a linear method, because here you have a linear subspace, Xn is a linear subspace or not. The reduced basis method as many other uh, um, numerical methods is a linear method so that the decay of the Kolmogorov n with somehow is the best that you can do. Needless to say that typically you cannot compute the infimizer here exactly because this is of uh, combinatorial complexity. Now the question might be under which circumstances can we guarantee that this n width decays fast? Um, a typical assumption is that the bilinear form that you have seen earlier allows for a separation of the influence of the parameter mu and the primitive variables think of space and time so that you can split the influence of the parameter from the influence of the primitive variables that is known in the reduced basis community as an affine decomposition. So in many cases, this is true. And it's also known that if it's not true, there are methods to have such an affine decomposition on an approximate level. And it also allows to separate offline and online. Then there is a result which has first been proven by Annalisa Buffa, Tony Patra, and others, and later in this form was proven by Olberger and Rabe. Um, I explain why I put this in, uh, in parentheses here in a minute. So if we know that the bilinear form is bounded and affine decomposable and coercive, then we know that there is a exponential decay of the Kolmogorov n width, and you see the QB here goes into there. And that form, if you have instead of the instability uh, here, the coerciveness, then this is a result by Mario Olberg and Stefan Rave, but I mean, this slight generalization towards insub, uh, I mean, it's, it's not a big big thing, but you can you can extend it in fact to that setting. Good, so that is somehow the nice uh, problem realm where we know that we have fast convergence. Now, this is a problem of the, of the problem, which I said earlier, but what happens when you compute the reduced basis approximation in terms of a greedy? Is the greedy produced reduced basis approximation also good? And there, in fact, is a result by Binev and et al. also in their paper for coercive uh, problems, but you can also extend this to in substable. And it says the following, forget about all the details, just look at the orange uh, boxes. Now, the, the, the result says, if you have algebraic decay of the Kolmogorov n width, property of the problem, then the greedy also gets that decay. And the same holds true also for the better case where you have exponential decay. So if the Kolmogorov n width decays exponentially, then also the reduced basis approximation that you get from the greedy allows for ex, um, uh, exponential decay. So these are the good news. Third, why this works is the error estimation. Uh, estimation. Remember, we need this error estimate. And there, I mean, this part is well known, Sayers lemma or some kind of approximate of, of generalization of that. So that the error of the exact solution of the operator equation and the reduced basis approximation can be bounded by one over the coercivity constant or one over the sub constant times the error in the dual norm of the residual. And this is the coercive case. In our case, this would be Y prime here. Okay, so that is standard. 
And if we would now be able to uh, compute this right-hand side, then we would have such a rapidly computable error estimator. Now, in fact, it's known since uh, the early days of the reduced basis uh, method, the books that are on the market or the nice overview article that is in the science book by, by um, uh, Bernard Hastonk, that this norm is in fact decomposable. That means that this error estimator can in fact be uh, online efficient computable. However, and that is the starting point of what I'm going to talk now today, is that you need this relation between the error and the residual. And that has something to do with the question of the well-posedness of the problem. Now, in fact, um, the well-posedness, or I should say a little bit more, or should be a little bit more precise, the question if this operator admits to be an isomorphism is already clarified by, by the banach natchez theorem. So first of all, remember that we have this petrov galerkin type variational form where here's the trial, here the test space, the bilinear form in between. Uh, typically, we can show that such a bilinear form is, uh, is uniformly bounded. And then banach natchez tells us that this problem two here, this uh, operator equation admits a unique solution which is uniformly bounded by the right-hand side. Now, again, here you see the Y prime norm. So the relation of X and Y is crucial if and only if uh, the operator is injective. That's number two and number one that you have an in-sub condition, okay? Good. Um, second, which is also well-known, this is kind of an extension of the um, well-known Babushka theorem. And this extension goes back to Shu and Sikatanov. Again, assuming that you have a boundedness of the bilinear form, that you have a discrete pound counterpart of the subcondition, typically known as Ladyshenskaya babushka baretsi condition. And then if we know, denote the uh, discrete solution by U delta mu, then we know that the best approximation uh, that the, the, I'm sorry, that the reduced or uh, uh, tr uh, truth approximation is bounded by the best possible approximation in that space. And uh, the relation here is the, the boundedness uh, um, constant divided by the in-sub constant. This improvement by Shu and Sikatanov is that typically in the, the older result by Babushka, you had one plus here and this one plus they got rid of. The important thing of this is that this allows us to get this error residual relation where here you have the trial and here you have the dual space of uh, the trial and test space respectively. So what would do we learn for the Schrodinger equation out of that? So if we want to put the, the, the initial Schrodinger form parameterized PDE in that form, we need that the operator from X to Y prime is boundedly invertible. That is what I call well posedness. And I would like to point out that this is more than just existence and uniqueness of a solution. It means that this is that the operator L and also in its inverse is bounded independent of mu in the specific norm in one case from X to Y prime and vice versa. So that means we always have a triple operator trial and test space, which need to fit together, okay? Second, we need a discrete in sup or LBB stable petrov galerkin formulation. Otherwise we wouldn't get the best approximation. We would need to get ideas how the numbers for the in sup and the continuity constants are, or at least good estimates. We need an online efficient error estimator and we need an estimate for the Kolmogorov N width. And that is already somehow bad news because in the same paper by uh, Mario and Stefan Rabe, it was proven that the, uh, the Kolmogorov N width is poor for the transport equation and we generalized that for the wave equation. Now, since transport and wave are already in the spirit of, of hyperbolic, and we know that Schrodinger is also a problem in that direction, we somehow have to expect that the Kolmogorov N width at least for certain cases of the Schrodinger equation is also poor, okay? So that's, that's the issue with which we are confronted here. 
So concerning well posters of Schrodinger in the sense existence and uniqueness of, of solutions, there is a huge literature on that. So for time dependent linear, nonlinear using typical semi-group theory uh, with stationary potentials, there is an overview article uh, which, which I quoted here. Also for the time dependent Hamiltonians multi particle, there's also huge literature on, uh, by far there's more than what I can put on that slide. Um, however, as far as what I could see or what we could see, there is no space-time variational formulation. I will come back uh, to that in a minute. And um, those, those papers that we could find in the literature typically require a certain regularity of the wave function. Now coming back to the Kolmogorov N width, it's also kind of well accepted that the smooth dependence of the solution with respect to the parameter yields a fast convergence or fast decay of the Kolmogorov N width. That means if we have a certain regularity of the wave function, depending on how the parameter enters, this is somehow the good, uh, the good situation means we are also interested in the situation where this is less good. So that means we, are three, we have three issues. We would like to have a space-time variational approach because this is kind of our interest. Second, we are interested in minimal regularity requirements concerning the initial condition, since we know that the solution stays in the same regularity class as the initial one. And we also want that the operator is a boundedly invertible mapping from X to Y prime, which means we have to identify suitable X and Y such that this, this is true. So that is basically what I want to consider in the remainder of my talk. So I need some notation. Uh, first of all, L2 here is complex valued. So that's a slight difference. We have a Standard Gelfan triples, again, complex valued. So nothing special, but uh, complex valued. H and V are equipped with the usual inner products and norms. Also the duality. Now, of course, on the right-hand side, you always need a complex uh, conjugate, but otherwise they are simply induced by the inner product in L2. And if you see this uh, double line H here, then I mean L2 with values in H which you could also write as L2 in the space-time cylinder with complex uh, values. Okay, so this is somehow the notation that I'm going to use. Now, if you start with the Schrödinger equation, you could think, okay, why don't we go the same path than what is known for the heat equation? So basically you take here for the space part integration by parts so that you have the, um, uh, spatial gradient here that comes from the uh, from uh, Laplace. And you leave the time derivative on the left-hand side uh, of the, the bilinear form. And just as a side remark, even if you would put uh, this to the right-hand side, doesn't really change it. So here you have the potential, everything the same. And now you can analyze the in-sup condition. And this is a well-known strategy used also in the paper by Chris Rapp and Rob Stevenson, or also Gianluigi and others, that in order to prove the, the in-sup condition, you look at the supervisor. That is the argument of the soup in the in-sup. And in fact, you can, you can characterize that for this uh, uh, variational form directly. And it looks like this. And the only difference to what is known from the heat equation that here you have the complex unit. Okay, now for the heat equation, we know that we have a, a well-posed situation. So here you might think, okay, good, uh, everything is okay. And now if you go for the proof of the in sup uh, condition, you have to bound the norm of the supervisor from below. Okay, now you compute that. And then here the first two terms look great, but then here, unfortunately, you have this negative term of the imaginary part of this one. And this is exactly the difference to the, to the heat equation because exactly that uh, term doesn't appear there or is different. And in fact, we could also see numerically um, that this uh, variational formulation of the Schrodinger equation is ill-posed if you have non-smooth data. So that was somehow uh, the first dead end in which we ran. Okay, so it came as a, not as a big surprise that maybe an ultra weak formulation might be a way out. Also there, there's a huge literature 
much more than what I can put here on that slide. Um, and let me uh, uh, show you the idea of this ultra weak formulation. So we start with a smooth function in time and space, complex valued, terminal value zero and boundary value also zero. And now we integrate by parts with respect both to space and time and all appearing uh, derivatives. So let's start with the left-hand side, G in the inner product in L2 over space and time. Now here you have the complex conjugate. Then uh, this is just the Schrodinger equation. So nothing has happened. You still see V bar and V bar here. We just insert the Schrodinger equation. And now you do integration by parts. Namely, we put the U prime up here. So you get the two boundary terms. And we also put the, the Laplaces and the, uh, the potential on the right-hand side. And so here the boundary terms vanish because we have, you assume that we have uh, homogeneous um, directly conditions, both for U and for V. And since we assume that the terminal value here is zero, this is canceled. And so we are left with this, um, with this formulation. And if, for example, we know the initial condition, then you can put this as a kind of a cross product so that this part here remains. Okay, so that means th this ultra weak form here uh, would, would look as follows. You put all of the derivatives on the right hand side, and that is nothing else than the dual of the operator S where S stands for Schrodinger. So if, if you take the Schrodinger operator, you put it by uh, duality on the right hand side and the, the initial condition appears on the right hand side. Okay, good, so that's a trial. And now you may ask, okay, one is that will post and uh, we have to analyze that. And in, in particular, we have to find appropriate trial and test basis because remember the triple of bilinear form or operator trial and test space makes finally the statement whether or not uh, uh, the operator is boundedly invertible. Okay, so there is a method introduced in an earlier paper by Wolfgang Dahmen and others to analyze such, such a, a form. Uh, and it starts with considering the operator in classical form, so point-wise form. So you see here T and X are in the space-time cylinder. Um, and this is meant to be point-wise. You see all the derivatives are in place where they originally were. And the next point is also important that all homogeneous initial and boundary conditions are associated to this operator in classical form as essential boundary conditions. So the operator does not only consist of the PDE operator, but it also includes initial and boundary conditions. Okay? That means in classical form, we can write down the Schrodinger equation pointwise as S circ U is equal to G circ, where G circ is also the classical form of the right-hand side, which is now posed in the space of continuous functions in time and space, uh, complex valued. The next ingredient that we need is the classical domain, namely the domain of the set of all those functions such that the application of S circ is still continuous. So the space of all those functions such that the application is still continuous and satisfying the, the boundary conditions, okay? And this, this classical domain will play uh, a role in the analysis. Here for the Schrodinger equation, it's, it's not very difficult to, to come up with a formula for this classical domain. So in that notation, you, we need one derivative in time, two in space. We need initial conditions, homogeneous initial conditions at the left-hand side of the time interval. And we need homogeneous uh, boundary conditions on gamma. And the good thing is that this can be written as a tensor product and we see one in time. Uh, with initial conditions uh, on the left-hand side and C2 in space with homogeneous boundary conditions. So that's comparably easy. Good. Finally, we need uh, the formal adjoint, which we have seen already, namely the formal in, uh, uh, adjoint appears by basically doing integration by parts in this uh, norm for all smooth test functions. And what we have already seen earlier, 
under suitable assumptions on the uh, on the potential, namely as long as this is real value, the Schrodinger equation formally is self-adjoint. Good. Then was shown in this paper by Wolfgang, uh, Chris Rapp, uh, Gerrit Welp, and, and Huang, that once you can satisfy these two conditions, namely that the formal adjoint is injective on the classical domain, which has to be dense in U, and U will then be the, uh, the, the search trial space, and the range of that operator is dense also in U, then we can do the following. We define U as a trial space before this was X, but now in this specific case, I would want to use it U, is then L2. And the test space looks a little crazy because it's the domain of the classical adjoint operator. And then you take the closure under this norm, which is induced by the dual of the, uh, of the uh, continuous extension of the uh, adjoint operator. And they showed that in that case, this is well posed. Good. That has also another, another uh, option, namely, or not another property. Remember that I was after the uh, low regularity case. And as you see here, we look for, for solutions in L2. And that is exactly the low regularity case. So in that sense, the framework that was uh, presented in this 2012 uh, paper is exactly the right that we are looking for. Good, now we can now go to check that. And I don't want to go into too much of the details, but uh, in the paper, you see that we can in fact prove that the adjoint of this uh, formal uh, operator is in fact uh, injective. And we can also prove that the range is dense. Okay, then we go on the, the paper of 2012 and uh, we just assume that the right-hand side is, uh, is in that dual space, U, V, the uh, um, bilinear form and the right-hand side as above. And then it's known that the variational problem admits a unique solution and the subconstant is one. And remember in this error residual estimate, we had one over alpha or one over beta. And if beta is one, that means that error and residual coincide. And that is of course quite attractive for model order reduction because we know that the dual norm of the residual once you can compute it is exactly equal to, to the error. Now the price to pay is also somehow clear from what I presented, namely the test space is a little bit, let's say uh, odd, good. Once you can do that, now we are left to consider or construct the petrov galerkin discretization, namely finite dimensional subspaces, such that the discrete problem looks very much the same, but you put a delta here everywhere. And in fact, it's not that difficult to come up with such a, uh, such a petrov galerkin discretization. So in time, we take, uh, uh, for example, piecewise linear finite elements on the time mesh, which of course is now just one dimensional, so very easy. As long as you have homogeneous boundary conditions on the right-hand side, remember the terminal time that this is the requirement on the, on the test functions. So you could take any kind of piecewise linear finite elements and in space, we may choose any conformal finite elements in H1 intersected H2 because we have all the derivatives on the test case. So that's why you need H2 here. So think of quadratic finite elements. And then we, we you use a standard textbook on, on finite element uh, analysis and we have the standard approximation properties for those, uh, for those spaces. So nothing new here. Good. Now, the idea here in order to guarantee the, the stability is we do not start with a trial space and then look for sup supermises in the test space because that is not completely trivial to realize for the Schrodinger equation. But what we suggest is we start with a test space. So we take this R delta tensor ZH. So that's why we need the C2 for space and uh, C or uh, piecewise linears for time for the test space. And then we basically uh, uh, construct the trial space as the mapping of that. Okay, good. Um, have standard um, uh, norm equivalences. 
And then you apply to this smooth test spaces, the adjoint operator, and we get these guys as trial spaces. So even though remember we are after a L2 approximation, this is how the functions look like. They look at a first glance smoother. So that's the real part on the left and the imaginary part on the right hand side. But in fact, the solution, uh, the, those functions are L2 and not more than L2. So these are our, our trial uh, functions with which we try to approximate the, um, uh, the solution. Again, as before, we can prove in sub one because the, as I said, the trial functions are just the image of the test functions under the adjoint Schrodinger operator. So that's the same. And now you may ask, oh, if you suggest to use those strange kind of trial functions, how is the approximation property? And uh, just look at this one here without going to all details. We look at the L2 norm of the exact solution and then you get delta t to the k plus h to the m minus one, as long as the solution is smooth enough. So we get the standard finite element type approximation results, even though we, we uh, use the seemingly non-standard trial functions. Okay, another issue which is important for, for Schrodinger is the question whether or not the approximation is norm preserving or slightly more general on the operator level if the variational formulation is such that the norm is preserved. And by norm preservation, we need, mean the following. We start with a, with, a, with a wave function. In our case, it would be u at time zero. You look at the L2 norm of that. And now you ask if that energy, namely the L2 norm of that is the same for all times. And that is what is known as the norm preservation. Typically, this is uh, proven under certain assumptions. So first of all, of course, the right-hand side needs to be zero. Otherwise, this injects energy into the system. So that's why you only look for g equals zero. But now comes the point, typically, you need smooth initial conditions. And you see here u is in v, that means u is in h1 or h10, and that means the solution stays in h10 for all times. Means necessarily, if you are asking for a norm preservation, then you are in the smooth case. And so that is maybe the, the good case for model order reduction. And we also need some assumptions on the potential, namely it's differentiable, it's uniformly bounded positive and Hermitian. Uh, so this is this is well known. And then uh, for this specific ultra weak form, we can prove in fact that uh, the, the ultra weak form has additional regularity. So even though we are only looking at ultra weak, we get this additional regularity here. And then this is also non preserving, but assuming of course, an uh, smooth initial condition. Now, what happens with the with the suboptimal discretization? Now, typically you look at a discretization like that, that you do a space discretization, and then you look for a time marching scheme, and you are after a time marching scheme for which you can prove that this is norm preserving or energy preserving. Once you do a simultaneous space and time discretization, it doesn't really make a sense because you may have completely different discretizations in time and space and you do not have time slaps from one time to the next one where you would want to preserve the energy. So, but what we can prove is that the difference of the solution at some time t, and here it's phrased for the terminal time, but you may also view this for any time t, and the difference to the initial energy is the same order of approximation that we had in the, uh, in the original um, discretization. So the message is once you do an inf sub optimal discretization, inf sub one, you get norm preservation or energy preservation up to numerical accuracy of the approximation of the scheme. Okay, again, in the smooth, uh, case where the initial condition is smooth. Now you may say, okay, but I do insist on norm preservation. What can you do? And here's the second result. If you give up in suboptimality, but we can construct a Galerkin discretization, same initial, uh, same, same trial and test space, 
which is non-optimal in the uh, in soup case, but then we can prove in soup stability. So basically the message is there's no free lunch. Either you insist on non-preservation, then you go for non-optimality with respect to stability, or you have optimal stability, but then you cannot go for, uh, for exact non-preservation. In all cases, we need smoothness. Now, what about the numerical solution? If you do this simultaneous space-time discretization, this is the nightmare that you get. So this is the stiffness matrix, looks kind of ugly. So here we have tensor products of space and time, all here in uh, the real and the imaginary part. And the W here comes from the, from the potential. So if the potential can be separated in space and time, then also these animals will be a tensor product, but this cannot be assumed in a moment uh, from, from, from the very beginning. So that means the stiffness matrix is a multi-factor tensor product animal. And in order to solve that efficiently, you need very clever ideas from the Merkel linear algebra where there are people that know that much better like me than uh, Valeria Simoncini, Davide Palita and others. So I'm not going to, to talk on that today. However, what we, we can see is that of course, the, the condition number over, over the dimension of the matrix grows. So that is not a surprise. But what you can see from these three lines here is that we did a stupidity, namely we choose time and space levels completely different. The green one means time is one level less than space, red is the same and blue is the difference of plus one. It means we take a discretization where once you would take a standard discretization in space and a time marching scheme in time, the CFL condition would be violated. So you would see uh, severe stability issues, but what you can see here is the condition numbers doesn't really make any chain, uh, difference, even if you do a seemingly strange discretization. And the same holds also true for the numerical in subcondition, you see it's always one, even if you take J in the level in space and in time on, on seemingly uh, crazy combinations, but it, it, it is in fact also numerically optimally stable. So what, what we wanted. Now the question, what, what happens with the approximation and what happens with the norm preservation? And in order to, uh, to, uh, to look at that, we examined three different uh, cases. Number one is a smooth case in smooth initial conditions, C infinity, norm one, where we have a formula for the exact solution. So we can compute exact errors and everything is nice and smooth. Second, the solution is an H1 here with the absolute value, norm one again but it's not continuously differentiable. There is no formula for the analytic solution and we computed just a reference solution. And finally also a non-smooth where here you have an indicator function, which is in L2, but not more is discontinuous. No analytical solution. Again, we computed a reference solution. Here's the result uh, for the, for the uh, L2 error. So first of all, again, we see that this is the, the non-smooth case where, where um, one would assume that the standard um, uh, time marching scheme would run into problems. Uh, problems. It converges. It also converges if you take seemingly crazy uh, combinations of level in space and time. So you really see that the unconditional stability with respect to discretization in time and space can also be seen on a computer. And finally, what about the error and the norm preservation? So first of all, the straight lines are the errors. So in, in blue, red, and green. Uh, blue is the smooth case where you assume, uh, where you can expect a certain decay. Then here you have the uh, Sobolev case, H1, where you uh, would just have linear, uh, at most linear uh, convergence. And the green one is the non-smooth case. And what we compare the straight lines, the error, and these dotted lines are the difference in the norm preservation. And in fact, you see the, those lines are more or less parallel. In fact, here is even the norm preservation a little bit better. And the message is that in fact, we see that the uh, norm preservation is in the range of the numerical precision. That's the first message. The second message is that even in the low regularity case, we get the expected uh, maximal rate of, of convergence that you get from the uh, trial and test space selection 
Uh, and what we also saw in that case is that in fact, time marching schemes severely suffer from uh, the um, uh, lacking of regularity. Good, let me summarize. So I try to propose you a well-posed ultra weak space-time form for the time dependent linear Schrodinger equation along with the correspondingly optimally stable petrov galoch in discretization, optimally stable in the sense that the inf sup and also the discrete inf sup is one. There's no need for a CFL condition. We have seen that the, the specific petrov galoch in discretization, optimally stable only allows for asymptotic non-preservation, whereas a non-optimal stable Galerkin scheme uh, allows for norm preservation. Uh, and of course, there's lots, lots to be done. So I said at the beginning, the better title would have been some preparations for a reduced basis method for Schrodinger. In fact, the solvers here for this, this multi-term tensor product uh, stiffness matrix, uh, there are first approaches for transport, heat and uh, wave equation in those papers, but not for the Schrodinger yet. That is something that needs to be done. Then the reduced basis method, since you have seen that the trial, uh, the test space is somehow delicate, it's not always clear whether or not the uh, residual is decomposable with respect to parameter and, uh, and uh, primitive variable. So that's why maybe one would need to use a hierarchical error estimator. However, there's also re a recent work by Olaf Steinbach and others where they looked at other variational forms with fractional um, orders of uh, differentiation where there is at least a hope after what we discussed last week in over Wolfgang with, uh, with Olaf that uh, then the residual would be decomposable, but this is uh, more speculation right now. And then of course also optimal control in that framework with Schrodinger and other equations. So, and with that, I see I'm in time and I thank you very much for your attention and your patience this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Urban, for this very interesting talk. So now it's time for questions. As usual, you can unmute yourself directly and, uh, you know, do your questions to Professor Urban. So let me see if someone from the audience has questions. Okay, so if not, maybe I can start with some, uh, with some questions. Uh, I mean, you showed us basically that uh, there are some problems, right, with the non-smooth case, right, mm -hmm. in the sense that you cannot expect a convergence. And uh, are you planning to, I mean, are you trying to generalize your results to this case, or do you think that it's really complicated, you know, in terms of numerical analysis to do that, or is something that you're working on because I mean in, in applications it's something that can be really useful. Yeah, I mean maybe I was not clear enough on that statement. Our numerical discretization works in the non-smooth yeah. case. Yeah. So it means you get L2 order of convergence. And if you want to approximate an L2 function, you cannot expect high order unless okay. you do whatever, this uh, uh, discontinuous Galerkin or whatever. But with a conforming method, that's the best whatever you can do. However, we reach that, which somehow from at least what I saw is, is, is not possible time marching scheme. So that is one issue where space time, in fact, gives you some improvement over traditional Okay. Uh, discretizations. Okay, great. So we have a question actually, so you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. I have a question at the beginning of the presentation where you spoke about the Kolmogorov width of curly P. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'll go back to the slide. Let me see. Oops, can I switch there in? Oh, that's always the bad thing if you have too many overlays. Mm, where is the Kolmogorov and with result? Well, slide three, slide four. Yes, there, right? So the, the curly P is the parametric space, right? Yes. Um, 
are you saying that the Kolmogorov width of curly P will behave the same way as the Kolmogorov width of the, the solution manifold? Because for me, it's not always the case. For example, for linear equations, you have to have um, a bounded operator. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this is what I did not get here. Because the what for me, what's what we need is that the decay of the Kolmogorov width of the solution manifold to decay fast. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's exactly what 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 is written here. So P is is the the uh, the parameter. Mm -hmm. And if you look here, so u of mu, that's what you call the solution manifold. Namely, take the union over all u mu, depending on the parameter mu, right? Yes. So that is what, what people call the solution manifold. I, I try to avoid to say, to call it manifold because my, my, my dear colleagues from algebraic geometry uh, cool. <laughs> criticized me quite, quite a lot. So that is, that is the, exactly the decay of the, of, the, uh, of the solution manifold. Now, the result of, of uh, so Buffa et al, they prove it for the special case of the, uh, the, of the thermal block example, which I think many of you know. And the result by Ulberger and Rave is exactly as, as, as stated here with the only exception that X in soup is, is coercive. And in fact, the only thing that they assume is that P is compact. So the parameter set is compact. And that here you have this affine decomposition. And then they prove exactly this result that you get exponential uh, decay rate. Yes, this I got, I'm sorry, I will repeat the question, but I still did not get, for me, the Kolmogorov width of the parametric set is different than the Kolmogorov width of the solution space. I will call it solution space. And it can behave the same way under some conditions. And are you saying that you don't need conditions for that? I, I did not I did not understand your question because, I mean, here I'm basically only interested in the Kolmogorov n width of the solution, depending on the parameter, and that's just the notation here. D n of p is exactly the width of the uh, of of the solution manifold. So, uh, are your solutions? Do your solution live in p? No, 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 no. They are in x. X is the trial space. You sub mu is a function in x. Hmm. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. So it's not the n width of, of the set p. It's, it's really the, the n width of, uh, of the set of all solutions as, okay. as a subset of the trial. So in our case, this is L2. L2 in space and time with values in, in the complex numbers. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Okay, Trajan, please. Yeah. So very nice talk, uh, Carson, thank you. This is exactly what we wanted for our uh, uh, seminar. So, so thank you, it was, it was very nice. So I have a, I have a question. So um, I'm, um, I really like that. So you talked about error estimates and how those are optimal and uh, Wait, so I, optimality. I, I, sorry, I, I could not really understand you for a minute. Oh, okay. So I was saying that, uh, so in your talk, you discussed about um, error estimates and their optimality. Mm -hmm. And and so I really like that. So we looked at, so I have the, my question is the following. So looking at the POD, so not mm -hmm. RBM, but POD. Mm -hmm. So there is work by uh, Kulinsch and Fulfine and uh, they consider the difference quotients in the, mm -hmm. in the set of snapshots in mm -hmm. order to... Um, to, to um, guarantee optimality for pointwise error estimates. And we worked on this as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, it turned out that it is, you know, in our, in our work, we, 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 we showed that if you don't make, uh, if you don't include the difference quotient, so there, there are pathological cases in which the time, time derivative is not approximated, uh, doesn't mm -hmm. build optimal error estimates. So that at the PO, this is at the POD level. POD. I would, mm -hmm. POD. Mm -hmm. I was wondering whether you have seen anything like that with respect, uh, so in, 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 in your work 
with respect to pointwise in time error estimates or where this was not an issue? No, no, um, because I think if, if you go for variational formulation in space and time, then automatically you somehow lose the pointwise information in, in time. Uh, the, the reason why, why, why we started with this space time stuff is that we wanted to have optimality. And basically the price to be paid is exactly what you're saying that somehow you lose time-wise uh, information. That's why also when, 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 when I first discussed on that, and then people said, well, is this energy preserving? And then I talked with Andre Suli, what does it mean when you have a variational formulation in, in, in space and time? What does, does energy preservation mean? Because, and it took us really quite a while to, to, to understand, okay, we, you cannot expect that. That's why you only have this up to numerical precision, but it's a different way of thinking than piecewise, or, or uh, sorry, point-wise in, 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 in time, so. Yeah, that's why also maybe POD is, is really different in, in, in here. Yes. Um, doesn't, doesn't mean that it should not work because after all, we also after a L2 approximation, since we know that POD is optimal in L2, there should be some link. Okay, very nice, thank you. But I'm not aware of that link, I'm too stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Are there other questions? Did Can I ask one more? Of Can course, I ask one, of one I quick question? Sorry, sorry, Karsten. So, so at when um, when when um, you talked about the discretization um, at the spatial level, did I understand correctly that somehow you needed H uh, two, the conforming case, you needed H two finite elements? Mm -hmm. Is that for correct the, for, for the test functions? Remember, we, we have this crazy pair of trial L2 and test, uh -huh. which is in this crazy closure uh -huh. of the I domain. And the, uh -huh. and the domain is C2 in space because you have all derivatives on the test side. Uh -huh. and that means uh -huh. on the test size, only for the test function, we need this high regularity H2 exactly. That's, so that's why we have their splines of at minimum quadratic, even cubic order. And then the right. trial ones appear by applying the adjoint of the Schrodinger to this nice smooth function. So that's why the trial function look crazy because they are just the application of the adjoint of a PDE operator to smooth uh, functions in, in space and time. Okay, 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 so, thank you. So, so we only need it for the test ones, not for the trials. Okay. Mm. Gotcha, all right, thank you. Great. So let's see if there are other questions for Professor Urban. It looks not to be the case. So I would like to thank again, Professor Urban once again.